Welcome back to another Sound Truth interview. I'm your host, Adam Miller. And today, as we are entering into our Holy Week, we are joined today by Robert Nash, who's the author of a great book called Last Words, Seven Sayings from the Heart of Christ on the Cross. I know that we're all familiar with this. It's, it's a great way to study, especially during this week, what Christ accomplished for us. But uh, it's always a w- great way to come at it with a, a new, fresh perspective, a new way of, of seeing what was actually accomplished in these few words, but powerful words of Christ on the cross. So, uh, Robert, thank you so much for being a part of the many voices for that one message and for talking to us about this book. That's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Why don't you get us started by telling us a little bit about yourself, because um, I think you obviously have a connection to these words that were meaningful to you to write this book. What, what prompted you to put these, these, these last sayings of Jesus together in this form? Yeah, I, um, I grew up in an evangelical church, uh, f- fell in love with Jesus, grew up, became a Christian, but we, I never went to a Good Friday service and probably nearly 20 years ago went to one and it struck me so profoundly um, mm-hmm. uh, how the pastor offered a, a reflection on the week of Christ and encouraged us to study the gospel and w- what implications that has for our lives. And, and uh, I've read a number of different books. And as I've been reading and, and becoming, you know, in the, the pastorate and in ministry, trying to offer my people uh, a closer look at Jesus, who he is, what he said, and, and, and wh- why that matters. And I, I, I didn't find anything about the last words of Christ that uh, that struck me in a way that, like the as I was studying it that I I thought I could put something together um, that would help my people. So it's not it's not a bunch of messages, but but uh, ins- inspirational um, exploration of the of each saying that Christ uh, said on the cross. And I think it captures who he is, what he was about, and why that matters for us. And it was really encouraging for me just to explore that. And I'm I'm happy to be able to share that with others. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, I I have a similar upbringing. I grew up in the church, and in our tradition, we didn't really emphasize the the individual days of Holy Week in any particular manner. But uh, then when I got into radio, and we're, we're doing like daily segments, all of a sudden it became, oh, wow, there's there's really individual days here where we actually see some of these things unfolding and really focusing in and slowing down during this Holy week allows us to, to see some things that we're so familiar with. And yet they kind of rise to the surface in a different way. Our, our, I think our, our attention span for meditating on, on smaller bits is heightened. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a, there's that, there's a need for that too. I think our hearts want, uh, to meet the Lord, or we need to meet the Lord if our even our hearts don't want it, and and we can pause and we can look at some of the darker sides of what happened and reflect on that, and then see it, it helps prepare us for the wonderful truth of the resurrection of Christ too. So it's there's a lot of uh, a lot there uh, even during the week, but then in the, the last day of his life as well. Yeah, it's kind of actually a challenge for pastors. I'm a pastor as well, and uh, it can be a bit difficult because you get, you know, Palm Sunday and you have Resurrection Sunday, and you might be able to work in, you know, a Maundy Thursday or a Good Friday service. But I mean, there's so much content. I mean, the Gospels give so much to the final week of Jesus that uh, it's hard to get through that in kind of an expository way and, and pull all those things out in just a short period of time. Uh, but I mean, we can spread it out. We don't always have to cram it into, uh, you know, one week. This is something that is really why we celebrate every Sunday to remember yep. what Christ accomplished on the cross in this Holy week. Absolutely. Absolutely. Every Sunday we can celebrate the resurrection of Christ. And, and what's great is every year we can come, we come back to this and we can explore it, um, in new and exciting ways and relevant ways. And, uh, it's just great. Mm. Yeah. I think what's so profound about uh, the final week of Jesus and uh, these, particularly his statements on the cross, there's a lot of teaching building up to it, especially, you know, when Jesus is confronting the, the religious leaders, and the Pharisees, the Sadducees in, in the kind of temple area. Uh, but the words that have the most resounding impact are Jesus' words from the cross. Why are those so significant? They're very limited, but why are they so significant? Well, I for me, when I think of you, you come to the end of something, you, you really put accent there of what's important. And here he says some 
really key things that capture his heart of compassion, his forgiveness, uh, some of the messianic prophecies that are coming to a, a, a culmination right here at this point, uh, the substitutionary death of Christ. We see so much here that is important theologically, but also personally, um, where our sins are forgiven and there's uh, the love of Christ is proclaimed. Uh, uh, so it's, it's really, I think, very clear, um, but also, you know, very emotional and powerful and uh, uh, meaningful as well. Mm. Now, these seven sayings, I mean, the, the, the ones that kind of stand out, this first one you have here in the book is Father, forgive him. I mean, this is ultimately getting right to the heart of why Christ is dying for our sins. Uh, he's seeking that work to be fully accomplished, but it's it's stark in contrast to in the moment that uh, he's dying. It's you know while we are still sinning, Christ died for us. While we're enemies, Christ is forgiving us. Absolutely, Romans five eight. Right, while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. That that uh, is exactly what I'm thinking. And uh, he's not thinking of himself. You know, you you think if I'm in that situation, I'm going to be self centered. I'm going to be angry. I'm going to be seeking justice. This is an unjust thing. A, an innocent man's dying for the 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 sinner, and and here he's proclaiming. Here he's, he's praying, petitioning the Father for forgiveness. And uh, I think it demonstrates his heart of compassion and the forgiveness we so desperately need. Yeah, this is. <laughs> You know, when you look at the con context of why Christ went to the cross, uh, we we see it in in a in a frame of Christ dying for our sins, sins of the world, uh, but we don't really see the the work of what Christ is actually struggling with. You know, in the in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, leading up to this, he's saying, "Let this cup pass from me." He he knows what he's he's about to drink the full cup of God's wrath, and asking for forgiveness in that moment really is showing us how deep the work of what Christ on the cross actually is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think, I think you're right that we don't, we don't grasp the full exchange that's happening there, you know, and that's where there, there's so much value in uh, meditating on how I've sinned against the Lord and what he's done to forgive it. And um, and then reveling in the fact that he shed his blood for us. And so, you know, even that Monday, Thursday, that communion uh, celebration where he says, this is my, um, my blood uh, given for you and my body given for you, that exchange and the connection between the, the Passover uh, and what they're celebrating and what he's about to do, uh, I think is, is super profound and super satisfying and joyful when we when we think about that, uh, that work on the cross for our sins. You know, one of the things that I think is really unique in these kind of interactions that Jesus is having on the cross is Jesus' response to uh, the repentant thief. Uh, and I think that the what's so beautiful about this is just really the simplicity of salvation. Here you have a person who's really on his last leg. He has nowhere else to go and nowhere else to turn. And his response is very humble, unlike the other thief. And Jesus' answer is just so reassuring of, of the work, the completed work of salvation. Yeah. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. That's what he says. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. I, I, I agree with you, Adam. That's, that is so comforting for me personally. Um, and he did, that, that thief, he has no track record. We have no historical evidence of what he's done other than his, his uh, robbery, his uh, thievery. And yet Christ gives him that assurance. He proclaims uh, who that Jesus is innocent to the other thief. He acknowledges his own wrong in the, in the innocence of Christ. And then he pleads for, you know, we remember me when you come in your kingdom. There's a statement of faith that this, this isn't the end of Christ. And that simplicity is so poignant. And it, it's one of my favorite interactions there at the cross because I see myself in the thief. I don't know if you're like, like that. You're like, I, I see myself there and I just need that desperately. Mm. No. Yeah, I grew up in a church, you know, where we talked a lot about like the sinner's prayer, you know, just getting people mm -hmm. to say a certain set of words. And you never see anything like that in the New Testament. You see a lot of presentations of the gospel and a lot of people repenting and asking for forgiveness. But this is really the culmination of the sinner's prayer. I mean, it really is someone crying out to Jesus for salvation and uh, Jesus' response to it. It really is 
it, you know, I just like that picture of the simplicity of salvation. Oh. Like, didn't get down from the cross and go and clean up and make apologies for all the people he had harmed. He simply turned to Jesus and Jesus saves him. Right. So th- what's great about that too, for our listeners, you know, is for your listeners is wherever they're at, they can receive Christ's forgiveness today and all they need to do is trust in him as their Lord and Savior. And, and he will remember them uh, when he comes into the kingdom. They, today, they can be with him in paradise if this is their last hour. This is the, the ninth hour. He calls on Christ. Christ saves him. I, I, I do. I, I'm with you. I love that, that, that simplicity there. We'll go from simplicity to kind of uh, obscure in the next one. We, we we see Jesus telling John, "All right, this is now your mother, Mary." And you know, you know what's going on there. That's kind of a complicated. Uh, that one is complicated, Adam. I, I agree. Uh, you know, as I've studied that one, woman, he calls his mom woman, which in our, you know, if I were to call my mom who's living, not a good idea. Woman, that would not be good, right? That that is not that's that seems offensive and rude. But in John chapter 2, that's how he addresses his mom as well. In the New Living Translation of the Bible, they say, dear woman, they add dear in there, to, I think, to capture mm-hmm. the connotation of uh, maybe the familiarity of what's going on. It's more about the content. She doesn't react negatively to it. What he's doing as, you know, Jesus is I mean, suffering. This is, I can't imagine. Can you imagine losing your child right there, innocently being tortured? You know, nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do. He was born for this, but it's still a horrible atrocity. And I think he's offering her a consolation. Typically, the, the eldest son, which he is, will take care of the, their parents. James says, if you don't do this, you're, you're worse than an unbeliever. This is, this is true religion. Um, and so Jesus is offering his disciple, the beloved disciple John, uh, as a substitute. Here, take care of your mo- my mom. And, and I think in, in, in the... In addition to that, there's also a consolation to John, who hours before was with the other disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was part of the top, you know, the, 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 the three with Jesus, praying with him. Will you be there with me? We stay awake. He's falling asleep, and Jesus is betrayed, and he hightails it out of there, out of the garden with the other disciples. And so I think in giving John this mission and giving his mo- John to his mom and his mom to John, there's a there's a uh, a, a word of consolation and comfort to both of them. Although it's obscure, I think we can see that God comforts us. Again, there's three words, it's three sayings Jesus has just given. And there's nothing about, hey, this isn't fair. Hey, you know, like, you know, God send lightning down and destroy all these people. This is, he's caring for his mother and his beloved disciple. Um, I think we can hear God's comfort to us in these words that he's given to Mary and John. Hmm. I think one of the ways it stands out is because of Jesus' call to his disciples, telling them they have to deny themselves, they have to uh, hate mother, father, wife, and children in order to be his disciples and take up the cross here as Jesus is on the cross. He's demonstrating that there's still value in in, in loving our family and take care, taking care of our family. But at not at the extent of, of what he's going there to accomplish, really, ultimately, for the kingdom of heaven. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this needed to happen. And uh, it, it was amazing. Um, you're right. Now, I, I love when, you know, Jesus demonstrates in, in the components of, of his suffering, the physical nature of it. And there, there is a pretty prominent physical component to it. And when Jesus expresses that he thirsts, we, we can get a glimpse into the struggles that he's dealing with. I mean, this, is, this has been a long projected process. Jesus has been on trial. He was taken the night before. Uh, they certainly weren't offering him, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, drinks along the way and the, you know, the seven stations of the cross, right? He wasn't being offered, uh, you know, a, a sip at a water fountain. So what's going on here? Yeah, so the, I thirst. It's actually, there's a, there's a prophetic word in the Psalms talking about the thirsting of the, the Savior, the Messiah. I think it's actually literally he's thirsting. And I think you captured it. You know, he comes off the Last Supper. He goes to the garden. He prays. He's, he's tormented by this future cup of wrath that he's going to have to drink. Um, and then he's betrayed by one of his disciples that, you know, those, who's been with him for three years. 
all his other disciples, they abandoned him. Now he's mocked, spit on, beat. He's under trial and he's under trumped up charges. He's accused of and sentenced to death. Um, they want to cru- they, they want to crucify him. They crucify him. And this beam he's carrying is 100 pounds, 100, 150 pounds. He can't even do it. He's going up a hill. He, he falls. A, a, a traveler from around the area um, comes and they have him carry it for him. And they nail his um, his wrists and feet to this cross. And then they put him on the cross. And he's dying not by bleeding to death, but by asphyxiation. It, this is the Middle East. He's in the middle of the day. Imagine under the, the sun, he's, his skin is roasting. Flies are biting him. I mean, this is a horrendous event. And I think his body naturally is at this thirsty um and and i think one of the things we see again and again and again in the bible is that is the philippians 2 um truth that he became one of us um he took on human form uh hebrews 4 15 says he was tempted in every way with yet without sin there's a sense that we see in scripture he is fully man that's the orthodox teaching of the church is he's fully man. Um, and so he takes our place because he's fully man. He could take our place and take our, his, our sin upon himself and pay the price um, fully. And, and so that's good news. But I think we, we see the suffering servant right there um, being fulfilled um, in those words, I thirst. And that's part of what I, I pull out from that, uh, that phrase. I'm sure there's more there, but that's that's one thing that strikes me. You know, he, he really is at the end of this this long process of torture, and many many works and many books and even movies have have gone into the the greater detail of of what Jesus physically suffered. But but I love how you kind of tied that into Monday Thursday and how Jesus was going there to drink the full cup of God's wrath. I mean, this is actually what's happening behind the scenes of what Jesus is is there to do to to satisfy uh, the become the propitiation, as Roman tells us, for the the sins of the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so that's what he's doing with that uh, that cup of wrath, and so. Um, you know, the, the other word he's, he talks about is it's finished. And we see the accomplished work of Christ um, there. One thing that I, I did is I just went through, and your listeners can do this, is you can go through the scriptures and see what does it say about Christ's death on the cross? What it accomplished? What was accomplished there? And just studying that is so worshipful. Um, and so to see that, that he is my substitute, he's my redeemer, he's my... Um, my forgiver, my savior. He is, uh, he defeated um, Satan. He is, uh, he has given me a mission. Of, he has sanctified me. He has given me righteousness. There's so many benefits that we see because he was willing to take this cup of suffering. It's, it's, it's incredible. And then to think, what does that mean for my life? Hmm. You know, when you get to, uh, we, we talked earlier about forgiveness. And when you think about the forgiveness, what sins have I committed? Mm-hmm. Well, those are forgiven because of what's happened 2,000 years ago. Wow, that's incredible. You know, when, when we, when we I, am, I am bought with a price. My body is bought with a price because of what he did. Yeah, yeah. And thinking that, that the Lord cared that much, that, that much about me, that he sent his one and only son, that, that he died in my place so I don't have to suffer that wrath. Mm-hmm. It, it's just incredible it's it's a lot for us to wrap our mind around and it's it's so much behind the scenes it's hard for us to even comprehend the extent of god's love uh, because we we can only sense it in in very in, intimate and small doses it's hard for us to fully get the grasp of what he accomplished you know one of the things i think is significant and we're studying through the gospel of matthew this year and uh, jesus words when he he cries out, uh, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, right? Uh, these great words were, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the cry of, of what Christ did to become forsaken so that we would be forgiven. 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think I, you know, we sound like we have a similar background growing up. I didn't really understand that that's actually a quotation from Psalm 22. Mm -hmm. And you read, that's the first part of it. Well, it keeps going Mm -hmm. and it, it details the rejection that he suffered in our place. It details being pierced. It details uh, again and again some of the some of the things that are happening to him in those hours. And what what I love about it is that it it captures this fulfillment and this culminating event, and it's changed my life. But it also ends with a, a word of of hope uh, about you know seeing the generations, uh, the coming generations. I want to say um, with that forsaking. You know, I, th- I think there's something there, too, just kind of recognizing w- we have no idea of the cost of what he's paid for our sins. And to be the son of God and to be forsaken, to be, you know, in the presence, he and he took on human form and did not count equality with God, according to Philippians, a thing to be grasped, but emptying himself, taking on the form of a servant. So he he, he had all of heaven. You know, we, we feel great when we we win um a game or we get a a great score on a test or we get a promotion or we have a new house and it's this it's exciting you know this new journey in life he had everything and he gave it up and 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 experienced the being forsaken by his heavenly father Um, it's incredible you know one of the reasons why i think these final words of jesus are so significant is just because of how hard it would have been for him to express those words because he's kind of pulled himself up to catch his breath you you mentioned before that he's dying of asphyxiation and so you know many scholars have suggested as you i think uh, kind of pull out as well that uh, jesus was quoting this whole psalm Uh, It was just the first words that he could get out because that's all he had breath for. But this whole psalm is what he's actually accomplishing for us on the cross. Right. And and yeah, so you have to put, he has to push down, as he said, put on his feet or pull down on his hands to gather enough air in his lungs uh, to breathe and say these things. And, um, you know, this is an oral tradition. They don't have like iPhones or Bibles, they have scrolls. And so they memorize large chunks of scripture and so uh even during passover a lot of the psalms were sung and so they, they're in their head and so he's quoting this and this it, it, this is a long psalm but it ends with this messianic hope of the resurrection and uh yeah i think he, he has that in his mind and so it's not not only do we see the the, the substitutionary cost the cost of what he's done but also that that future Sunday resurrection hope uh, is, is just around the corner as well. So it's, there's a lot there to, to mine out and to, to ponder. Mm. When Jesus declares, um, you know, into your hands, I commit my spirit. When Jesus gives up the spirit uh, to God, he, he brings this, this whole struggle to a conclusion. Um, but this is a great testament of the control that Christ had in what he was doing on the cross. Right. So not only do we see his humanity, but we see his deity as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, his, he, he is definitely in control. They, they said, you know, why do you call angels down? They're, they're, they're trying to provoke him or mock him. And, you know, he could have, he could have, I mean, he, he, he held the, the Bible says he holds the world together um, by the word of his power. And so he, the nails that are holding him there, he could obliterate and he could obliterate everything. And, and uh, he, he, he suffered uh, intent, with an intention to, to save us from our sins. And, and so he commits himself to the Lord um, because he, he wanted to. It was appointed and, and he took the cup the father had given him. Um, but what's interesting too, um, Adam, is it, it begins with a prayer to the father and ends with a prayer to the father in those words. There's this intimate relationship where, although he's been forsaken, um, you, you, you see this unity in the, the Trinity um, there at the end, uh, at least the Son and the Father. Um, it's, it's, it's very uh, poignant. You know, earlier Jesus has already said that no one could take his life unless he himself laid it down. 
And here he does. He lays down his life. This isn't, uh, you know, one of the ways I think that we look at this is, oh, how cruel the people were to Jesus. And certainly he was surrounded by enemies and he was forsaken by his own disciples and betrayed by Judas. But here we see that it was Christ who laid down his life for us. Right. Yeah. I was appointed for this, for, for this man to die. Yeah. And he did it willingly. It's totally true. Hmm. Would you, would you pray with us and for us? Um, this is, this is a week where I think that it, we need to be reminded of the words that Jesus said on the cross. We need to be reminded of what he accomplished for us. And uh, I think that uh, as we listen to these words, as we meditate on these words throughout this week, it will mean a lot to us to know uh, that as we listen to Christ on the cross, his words would minister to us in such a way that would transform us into the image of himself. Yeah, I'll do it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your sending your son to be the propitiation for our sins, to die on the cross on our behalf. Um, you did this even while we were still sinners. You died for us. You did this demonstrating your love for us. You love us that much that you sent your son to uh, save us from our sins, to redeem us, to buy us, um, just to uh, free us. Lord, we ask that you would use this week, these words, um, your spirit to work in us so that we can become more like you, that we can rejoice and worship you and follow you. Um, thank you for this ministry and for um, Adam here. May you get glory in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We've been talking with Robert Nash, who I, I guess we're friends now, so I can call him Rob, <laughs> who's written this excellent book called Last Words, Seven Sayings from the Heart of Christ on the Cross. And as we really focus in on this, this testimony of Christ and what he proclaimed for us, what he accomplished for us, now these words will help us to meditate on what truly happened as Christ bore the sins of the world upon his shoulders so that we might bear his righteousness and clothed in, in his glory. So, uh, Rob, thank you so much for being a part of the many voices for that one message, message for, for this book and for your time with us today to talk to us about, uh, about the final words of Jesus. You're welcome. Thanks, Adam.